the idea of people's bodies kind of becoming like borderless is kind of how I think of it is this idea of um, how people are shifting and especially today how people have all these different kind of personalities they have to play with different situations and so it's kind of you know this combination of all these like digital elements and these sorts of things um, coming into your mind and like forming your identity and who you are Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Mastrius Meet the Mentor with Jeremiah Palatek. My name is Gloria Chow. I will be the navigator for Jeremiah's mentorship group when it launches on January 21st, Sunday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, the Mastrius mentorship groups are groups of maximum of eight artists meeting for a monthly two-hour session with a mentor, and then a mid-month session with um, among the, the members only. And in between sessions, there are events that um, is included. And also there's a private chat group that we can communicate with each other in between sessions. And for more information, you can check the uh, masteries.com website. Okay, and for those who are not familiar with Jeremiah, uh, let me give a little bit of an intro. Jeremiah is an American artist. He grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota, and he attended the Lyme Academy College of Fine Arts the Glasgow School of Art and School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He currently resides in Prague, Czech Republic. Jeremiah's work as a painter is primarily known for rendering the digital world in oil paint. His subject matter includes, but isn't limited to paintings of video games, television shows and film stills. Jeremiah's art utilizes symbolism and imagery more common to the digital. The images are painted in oil, so viewers are forced to look at them in a new way. Jeremiah is currently represented by Fred Jim Pietro Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut. And today we're going to discuss with Jeremiah his pathway as a painter detailing his journey from the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts student to evolving into a more expressionistic, abstract, figurative painter. He will share insights into his painting approach and how it correlates with his methods of mentoring students uh, through an approach that emphasizes the fundamentals of painting and drawing. Jeremiah will speak about how he allows students to develop their own techniques and approaches as painters. So, okay, so. so Thank he, you for the intro, that was great. Yeah. All right, so why don't you start with a little bit about your background, like how you started with art or early influences and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota, which is obviously a pretty rural place. Um, but I grew up in like the city, which is, you know, back then was like 60,000 people. But in the summers, I'd go to my grandmother's house down in Kansas. And she lived in a small town called Munden, Kansas. And she was um, a very prolific outsider artist. And she created hundreds and hundreds of works. And she made all these paintings where she would use a magnifying glass and like look at rotting wood and stuff like this and then like paint, make these abstract paintings from that and um it was like literally her whole house she was even selling paintings out of her house like as a gallery um as well because there was this barn that probably got blown down by a tornado or something and all the shingles all the wooden shingles from the barn were everywhere and so she had my probably my grandfather or my uncle or somebody like sand them down really nicely, like sand down all of these old shingles. And then she put backs on of them and started painting birds and squirrels and stuff. So she had this kind of unique approach where she was painting, you know, wildlife um, as well as doing these abstract paintings. And I grew up 
really immersed in that. And I remember like going to her house was, you know, these very vivid memories that I still have um, as well. So that's, you know, probably obviously what led my pathway. <laughs> if there was something that really influenced me, I'm sure it was probably my grandmother. Um, but yeah, then I went on to study. Um, I actually started at a community college and took some classes there. Then I went to Lyme Academy. And that was when I first kind of visited a school that was, you know, outside of North Dakota. And there was like a different kind of energy there that I was like really, really intrigued by. And all the walls were full of these, you know, figure drawings and anatomical drawings and all this sort of stuff. So then I was pretty much hooked at that point. Um, and from there, yeah, I the long and short of it is I spent a year there and then um, kind of wanted to have like more artistic freedom, I guess I could say, or I felt like my artwork going in a different direction. So I transferred to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And there I basically, I studied painting the entire time there as well. And um, studied abroad at the Glasgow School of Art, which was really awesome as well. And then finished at the University of Colorado Boulder. That's where I got my master's from. But for the last like 16 years or 17 years, I've been teaching in Prague at a school called Prague City University. They just changed their name. But um, yeah, it's called Prague City University here in Prague. And um, I teach in the master's program there. And I'm a mentor for master's students in that program Um primarily, and I also run my own little school called Oko Academy, which is in Prague, and I do, like, figure drawing nights there, and it's kind of odd because, like, when you see my paintings, they might seem kind of, like, very, um, I don't know, not academic mm -hmm. in the sense of they're not quiet, you know, they're not really quiet academic renderings of still lifes or something like that. But in my school here in Prague, that's what I actually focus on is all like fundamentals. It's all observation based. So um, in my classes there, everything is based on looking and drawing. So we'll work from still lifes or we'll, we'll work from models or whatever it is, but it's always based on uh, observation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, you started... Um... Like looking at your getting influenced by your grandmother's artwork. So did you always know that you're gonna be an artist or you just kind of develop that? Um, I was big into like comic books. Todd McFarlane was this artist who did like Spider-Man and um there was a Levi's commercial I remember with him and he they were um showing like different people, like different occupations. And there was a commercial of him drawing. And I was like, oh my God, this guy is like 24 and his job is to make drawings. That's like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> right. It was kind of the first time I'd seen like a professional artist was probably Todd McFarlane drawing in a Levi's commercial, but or knowing that it was possible, you know, so I was big into like early on I was big into comics and like drawing from comics and this sort of stuff. Um, but then later on I got into like cartoonists and like pen and ink drawing a lot and cartooning and people like Ralph Steadman and these kind of very expressionist cartoonists as well. So mm -hmm. that kind of changed things when I started getting into like different types of illustration and more expressionistic illustration and these sorts of things as well. So yeah. Right, right. So your your trainings are have been all like mostly classical, traditional art, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So did you, you know, feel a uh, little rebellious or you know, like did you feel what what do you think of the training or is just it just like happened, right? Because you're you're there and then so you just learn what you need to learn, or you just always have this want to paint something else or you know, right. work in a different genre or, you know, that sort of thing. I think, I mean, I'm kind of a chameleon sometimes. Like, even when I look at my, like, Instagram feed or something, I'm like, where did this painting come from? Because um, sometimes I'll just, like, want to do a painting 
and I'll just make it. Like I did like a couple nighttime paintings um, a few months ago that were like realist, like naturalistic paintings and stuff like that. Um, just based on observation as well. So yeah, sometimes I still pop up and I'll just make like a completely different painting. But in general, like my approach to painting is is really um, kind of about searching, which is a way I found with drawing as well, where it's like when you approach a drawing, it's kind of like you're searching for an answer. You know, even if you're just drawing a, a pear on a table or whatever, you're kind of searching, you're trying to figure it out. And um, there's kind of a method to drawing that I was taught at Lime Academy by this guy, Stephen Sheehan. Mm -hmm. And um, it was where it, he talked about, he always loved to see people searching for the answer in their drawing. So it's like not the idea of erasing, but the drawing itself should show that process of trying to figure stuff out. And I think that's really cool too, to kind of, instead of focusing, you know, on the finished thing, like part of the painting is that whole process and that whole, approach to it and then you kind of end up with something and it's uh you know a document of you trying to find these answers to these problems and these sorts of things yeah mm -hmm. right yeah so the the process is more interesting right than you know yeah, and, and it can be results, like because it, it you know it just shows your history or your thought process and you know that sort of thing yeah it's always a balance <laughs> Because you can, you want to just do, you know, go crazy the entire time without refining anything either. Because um, you do want to communicate stuff too, I think, with your artwork. So it's a tough line to walk between, you know, expressing, you know, going in whatever direction you want and automatically following your instincts and then being like, okay, the light is coming this way right yeah one light source here it's the one way you know or the colors this is not working or whatever it is so it's like those basics kind of glue everything together still at the end of the day mm -hmm. yeah there's so many aspects in like picture making right so you have to worry about your fundamentals uh, the logic and then you want to express yourself and then you want to tell a story and communicate with the viewers so it's like a, a lot of going on while making right. the piece for yeah. sure i think and with um with students yes i can show some works too um with yeah. students i kind of like to approach that process the same way where it's like a problem solving type of a, an approach where it's like then you can kind of see like okay who first of all you know a first question can be who are you looking at like who do you think is good you know and then that immediately tells me an idea okay so this person likes this approach to painting you know so then I need to know the basics of things and we can kind of work backwards from that and it's like okay are you looking at this technique that they're using or are you looking at this color palette that they're using like what inspires you about this artist in your own work and then, you know, a really simple exercise can be to just put your work next to their work and be like, oh, I'm doing this a little bit differently and I want it to really be like this. Or, you know, it's not really stealing. It's more like just trying to figure out what techniques you're really interested in, you know. And then you can kind of problem solve back from that and figure out, okay, this is what I need to improve. This is what I need to get better at or these things are working Um kind of a logical approach painfully logical approach to painting maybe yeah um, yeah. yeah so there are you know I think there are lots of values in like master copy or you know this learning from right like, sure or just master about... copies I don't do those enough but yeah that would be good too for sure mm -hmm. yeah so yeah if you if you like you can um uh, maybe show some of your work and talk about your yeah. painting process, perhaps. Sure. Um, let me share my screen here. I think we should be good to go. Enjoying the video? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new Masteries videos are added. Does that look good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can I go through these now? Um, yeah, so this is a painting I did 
uh, started this last year, and I often work in terms of like a series of works. Um, and for a while, I was doing a different series of paintings every month. And I started off last year by this story called CJ, and that's the cowboy there, CJ with his hat and his horse. And I wanted to kind of like place my people somewhere. So I put them in the, the Badlands uh, of North Dakota. And when I, when I make these paintings, I kind of approach everything very loosely. And I work out the, the composition, the big main composition first and kind of place stuff where I want it to be. And then as I work, I start kind of whittling these forms out of there. So I don't always know where the painting is going when I'm beginning. When I started this painting, I didn't know there would be a horse there mm. or anything like that, but it just kind of appeared um, as I went. And so I think all these paintings in this group are all related to this story, um, which was 23 paintings. We won't show them all, but there's 23 mm. in total okay. um, of CJ. And then this is a fire, so... He sits down by the fire and uh, um, has an end of the night snack, makes some beans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the fire starts talking, talking to him. Um, but yeah, it's it was kind of my approach for this series. This isn't how I always do things, but All right. So here he is. Yeah, yeah. CJ. So it's like an imaginary character that you created, and you decide to do a series of it. Yep. So I started making works from that and like let the kind of let the story tell the work of the paintings, you know, because I don't plot, um, which might be a detriment. I write fiction as well. And um, I don't like plot anything. I just start, um, which is, you know, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do to change it. So I kind of started, you know, writing and making these paintings as I was going to. So sometimes the paintings would change based on what I thought. Oh, that's interesting. So when you start a painting, you said it's is a very loose or abstract um, yep. way. So you just put um, patches of paint on, color on, and then just react to it to to kind of tease a figure out of it right so they'd be all like um they most of these probably took about two two days maybe probably two days each mm -hmm. and um just because i need to let them dry um but i'll start off with those big gestures and i'll have an idea for a movement i want on the canvas so that's kind of where i start is just this basic could be like a zigzag or whatever it is. There's kind of a gesture um, to the shape I want of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And then I start pulling um, pulling things from that shape itself. Right. So, but like here you can see, I mean, this is kind of like a normal uh, bar, bar room mm -hmm. scene or something like that, where they're like, uh, the boundaries of their like bodies are kind of slipping away. Um, because the whole story is like this psychedelic, glitchy video game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're all like just paintings of um, of CJ going through that process. So you can kind of see that. But like, yeah, in terms of painting, I guess um, there's kind of like elements of surrealism and uh, these sorts of things present there as well. Automatic painting and these sorts of things. Yeah, and so. sometimes people think that they are um, digital, but yeah, these are all just, this is all oil paint. So like on this one where there's like the little fly thing on the computer or like as the pixelated fly thing or whatever, it's all just hand painted still. Um, and then I made up, yeah, made up like a computer company and like, you know, made up like a weird computer thing because i was like thinking about like imaginary computers and there's like a nice little bowl with one um i don't know if we can see in it but it's got one one macaroni left in it <laughs> okay but, yeah so but yeah that kind of gives you an idea of some of like my works from the last year um but I'm also kind of like a painting everyday person. So 
I'll draw, um, for the last two years, I've been drawing or painting every day, um, so far. So like on my, on my blog, on my website, um, jeremiahpolichek.com, there's just like, you can see what I've been up to in the last two days okay. or quite some time back. Um, but yeah, now I'm trying to focus on using multiple days to create works. Uh, rather than just kind of bust them out so quickly. All right. Yeah. So you're working with oil. And um, so how do you go about, you know, getting such clean images, you know, because it, mm -hmm. it takes time to dry. So do you let each layer dry and then to tighten things up? Yep. I'll usually work on two or three paintings at a time. Um, so I'll always have you know, something can dry for a couple days. So I'll have probably more. Yeah, I probably have like three paintings going on at once. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun to just pop into them. Um, sometimes, yeah, it's very rare that I'll complete something in one day um, from start to finish. But the, the layering is important. And then just uh, as you know, use everything your brush can give you, <laughs> right. you know, just be slow. If you need to be slow, just go slowly. Um, this sort of thing as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, in this, there's a lot of different layers and I'm, that's kind of part of the idea of these types of portraits. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it's just I'm I'm you know amazed at how you know clean the the lines are. So you know, would you say because you started with like really gestural marks or patches okay. of colors, then mm. do you like wait till it dries and then do you draw over it and and you know to get these very definite shapes right. out of I kind right I kind of will clean it up with just you know the. Uh, you know like a flat brush and kind of roughly gesture in my my darks and refine those shapes and blend those shapes out and then let that dry and then go on top with a darker color and like reinforce my darks and reinforce my lights um you can kind of glaze a little bit of areas if you need to have some more subtle blending or something like that um but yeah usually and that's always a question because I like those. I like when there's kind of sloppy brushwork too. I just can't help it, but like that painterliness yeah. <laughs> of yeah. sloppy stuff too. So sometimes I try not to, uh, not to, not to ruin that and go over it or anything. But I inevitably yeah, you do. <laughs> Leave a nice painterly area mm -hmm. type of thing. Yeah, because I saw some of your videos like you would like tape some of the areas oh right. right yeah yeah so do you have to let the oil dry thoroughly before you can tape it or it's it's okay to to tape it while it's a little bit wet i do it when it's wet mm -hmm. which is dumb but <laughs> but it works it works like 70 percent of the time sometimes i get mad at myself um but yeah it, it works or i mean sometimes i'll like just take a piece of paper and you can just, with a razor blade, just slice that. And then, you know, if you put it a, a paper up on your canvas, it won't necessarily just, like, smudge everything, you know. Yeah. So you can kind of just hold the there. paper there lightly and go on the edge with a with a brush if you need, like, a really crisp line to. Um, right. So your thing is uh, tape, right? Like, I mean, you can just kind of sit there. And yep. then and then you can just gingerly pull it off <laughs> Hopefully yeah. not too much comes off with the Yeah, tape. like this area down here. Um, I mean, you can kind of see like this would be taped on the side and then I would mm -hmm. just paint, you know, these lines in here individually. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it kind of starts off as a, this one would have started off as a landscape because I knew it wanted, I wanted it to be a place. You know, I wanted it to be somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I you... had that landscape first, and then I gestured on top of that, yeah. Okay, so you paint the whole landscape, like, as a layer mm -hmm. first, and then, you, and then you put in the gesture and decide on the 
the figurative right on it type yeah of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah and i notice on your um page that you know on the medium you have like about 100 mediums that you're you work right with. yeah it so, is pretty much whatever i yeah. can use yeah so it's like <laughs> alcohol ink and egg tempera and uh, right um yeah what else uh, quilting you know? <laughs> i do yeah i have my sewing machine right there actually <laughs> yeah i saw some like cushions you make they're so cool like how do you how do you get into that or how you know how does that you know fit in with your your work right. well i wanted to be um I wanted to be like the pillow king of Czech Republic, but uh, <laughs> it didn't work out exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I made a bunch of pillows for like two months. I got really, I really just got into um, fabric, like working with textiles and working with fabric. And I would um, cut pieces and then airbrush them. So they kind of have like a gradient on each little piece. And then I would kind of crudely sew them together um, into these new designs and these new shapes, but it was just so much fun because it's so immediate. Like if you need a big strip of red, you just cut it out and like, boom, there's your red or, you know, and it, I love that aspect of it and drawing with the sewing machine, um, was super fun. Um, there's like a certain mode you can put on it where it's like the free needle mode. So you can kind of move it all around, like, it's like a, a poor man's embroidery machine sort of situation. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's fun too. And so I was like kind of drawing with that a lot. and Just really getting into the, the medium was great. I should go back. But then I just had too many pillows because my pillows were not flying off the shelf. <laughs> oh, I would love one. I mean, so I'll... <laughs> all of a sudden I had like 15 pillows I'm like okay I need I need to slow down on the pillows I think so <laughs> yeah no they're they're so fun like I think they're they should they should fly off the shelf I mean I'm thinking you know, thank you maybe they'll, it's just maybe the, they'll the have venue. their day <laughs> yeah like it's just have to find the correct venue yeah um I think we we have discussed a little bit here but you have a question mm -hmm. um uh, how did you come to this style? What inspires you and what is the message you, you want to convey? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I kind of, there could be a long answer, but um, I'll try to make it succinct. Basically, um, the the idea of people's bodies kind of becoming like, borderless is kind of how I think of it is this idea of um, how people are shifting and especially today how people have all these different kind of personalities they have to play with different situations and a lot of that is about like these digital identities people make where it's like this is who I am and you curate it and you put out like this curated digital version of yourself and um, you can probably see it in like these types of portraits, I guess, um, in that, that sort of thing. So it's kind of, you know, this combination of all these like digital elements and these sorts of things um, coming into your mind and like forming your identity and who you are. And um, some of people think like this is like um, negative. I don't really think of it as like negative. I just think of it more as like portrait painting. <laughs> you know um just like a continuation of portrait painting in a way um yeah i guess with this one as well it's kind of this similar idea of this computer being this thing that kind of morphs identity and changes it before that i was making these paintings of video games um i probably have them here yeah i probably have some of those here well, maybe not but um I might have them. Anyway, um, I started off making paintings of like video games a long time ago. And I liked that idea of painting video games because it's like a screen and it's not something you usually live with in your home as like a painted thing. But people spend so much time, you know, in these virtual worlds that they're kind of like becoming 
different landscapes that people experience. So that's how I started was kind of through those digital paintings. And then they morphed into this explosive, um, abstract blobbies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. flying all over the place. And, um, yeah. yeah, but that's kind of the main ideas and ideas behind those paintings. Um, and now I'm kind of just interested in tools and like how people use tools. I think I have a picture of me like this one mm -hmm. oh, okay. is kind of like a ridiculous painting. Um, there's a nice horse in the back hiding out there right over here. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, I started kind of just liking tools, like how do people use tools and how do p tools kind of shape people if they're, um, a monster truck, you know, how does a monster truck make you feel if you drove around a monster truck, you know, it would like make you feel different. <laughs> the machine would like change who you are. Um, mm -hmm. these yeah, sort of things. More so powerful. it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah if, for sure. And then like, you know, when you're on a computer, it can change your whatever virtual environment, um, whatever tool it is. So I'm kind of making these junky, um, these junky paintings now of people morphing into machines. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, but they're I... also kind of, yeah, little, it just kind of feels North Dakota and with the hat and everything. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So what would you say is your, like, ultimate reason for, for doing art? Like, I mean, you know, it's something you, you have to do, or like, mm -hmm. or do you want to communicate with your, you know, other people? Right, I think, um, just like living a life where you can be open to this incredible history of art and literature and dance and music and you know all these things just opening yourself up to it more and more can just you know enrich your experience in life too you know and there's like a personal aspect and of course the right answer is probably to like communicate and all this sort of stuff um But yeah, in reality, I think probably a lot of it is just like negotiating the world and like being imbibed in art and these sorts of things can just like lead to a more meaningful existence in some ways. So, I mean, for me, yeah, it could be a painting, it could be a song or a dance piece or whatever it is. A cushion. It could be a cushion. <laughs> And I love that. I love that it could be a cushion, honestly. <laughs> it doesn't need to be a, a symphony orchestra. Yeah, yeah, it could be a cushion. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that. So so can you tell us a little bit about the mentorship? Like um why would you like um to get into teaching or you know like mentor others um and how would you plan to right. do I think I'm um, the the main thing generally like when I'm working with um when would working with almost any student I work with a lot of different types of students so I work with my master's students as a mentor here and then at Oko Academy my own school here I work individually with students as well And so, like, for me, the most important thing is that um, there's, like, some expression that we can connect to intention of some sort, you know? So we really need to define, like, what are your intentions and what do you want to do? And that involves, like, basic goal setting and these sorts of things and figuring out, you know, what techniques do I need to get better better at, which fundamentals do I need to improve, Um you know, what am I trying to say with this piece? It doesn't have to be a big, giant, complicated idea. It can just be like, literally, I want to paint flowers, you know? And um, if you start with, I want to paint flowers, you can go in a million different directions of painting flowers, you know, and figuring out what are the, you know, what is your approach to flowers and, you know, these sorts of things. Um, But also I like to couple that with um, some more like hands-on, workshop sort of things because I've been lucky enough to to be exposed to a lot of um, different materials and techniques like the the artist I spoke about earlier Stephen Sheehan 
he's the actually the guy that uh, edits that big Ralph Meyer, that big Ralph Meyer book, um, the Handbook of Artist Materials mm-hmm. and Techniques. And so, like studying with him, I got you know just I'm sure they teach a lot of the same stuff uh, everywhere, but you know I got to use egg tempera and make my own gesso and do these sort of things. So I do like to infuse um, like the trajectory of my time with somebody where I can also teach them some kind of like basic hands-on sort of stuff as well. And then, you know, they can take it or leave it and then just be like, oh, that worked out well. Okay, I didn't need to really learn how to do that or whatever. But, you know, you can incorporate it or not pretty much into your practice and see what works and what doesn't really, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. So with the master's and mentorship, um, so do you plan on, you know, going over like fundamentals and um, different things in this, yeah. Piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, just composition and color mm-hmm. in itself are just too areas that can change so much so quickly just by changing your viewpoint on, on on an object or approaching it in a you know in a way that's clear in the way you want to present it uh, and finding who are your people you know I, I try to help I look at a lot of paintings so I always try to find help people find their people <laughs> so if it's a landscape find... painter <laughs> yeah <laughs> Where can where can we find our people? Like exactly. Well, um, it's hard. It's hard to find your people. I still find people, and I'm like, how did I not? I'm supposed to know this person, and I never, you know, um, I never heard of them. There are just so many, um, so many painters. It's endless. But um, for me, I think yeah, just art documentaries, and I have a podcast as well that I do called the Painting Podcast. And um, on that, every time I go, it's so simple. And I know this is not, you know, serious art history research. But if I go to a Wikipedia page, immediately, you know, you've got all these rabbit holes you can go down um, of whatever it is. Like this, he was, this was his teacher. Oh, who is his teacher? Or who is her teacher? You know, and then like. Or they're part of this greater movement that did this. Oh, okay, let's investigate that and figure out who are these other artists. Oh, well, how is this? How is this person different than the other people in the movement? You know, and all of a sudden, you just got all these different things you can pull from. You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think identifying. I like to first just get clear on subject with students. And that kind of drives them insane a little bit sometimes. But I like to just be like everything, like portraits are a subject. Landscape is a subject. A still life is, you know, it doesn't have to be. It's probably better if it's not something complicated. Because then you can just pull from hundreds of years of art history, you know. Um, So just like figure out, okay, what's your subject? I want to paint people. Okay. How do you want them positioned? Are they working at a... 7-Eleven or are they in a golden chair or you know like Mm -hmm. but starting with that first thing is really critical it's like okay I want I want to do landscapes all right let's do that you know and I I like working with people that have all sorts of different um, goals you know it doesn't have to be we all want to paint the same way it can be a a group of people that want to paint different ways and want to improve different things so Right. So it could be different styles, people painting very different from from you, right? Because yeah. all principles are the same, like the fundamentals are the same in any kind of of genre right. painting, right? Yeah, for sure. Like I have there's certain types of painting I'm really very much drawn to that people are kind of surprised. <laughs> that I like it you know so much and so it's like you never know um yeah how somebody from a d- different approach can can help something even more like traditional or whatever it is um but it's also I think with with making art and these situations where you want to mentor somebody 
uh, you want to just make sure you know what their goals are and be really clear on that and then be like, okay, so let's approach it like you have a goal of wanting to improve this and this. How can we create exercises to help you, you know, short, short term goals to help you achieve that longer term goal? You know, just like you're trying to do, learn how to play basketball <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Right. So early on, you you said like for the, um, the student to say, decide on say whether they want to do figure or landscape. So is it just about doing like each painting or or do you think that they should kind of focus on like one genre first? Like, you know, they should just do a landscape, you know, I want to do landscape and I want to study that. Or is it mm -hmm. uh, you meant just to start each painting with like a decision that, oh, I'm going to do a, a, a figure. Right. I would do, um, I would think of a series. I mm -hmm. that I would probably recommend like thinking of any work as, as a series of at least like three paintings or something like that. Um, about a subject, it can be as much as 12 paintings, depending on how fast you are, I suppose, or how big they are. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it, you know, if you have three, then it becomes like, kind of, if it's three donut paintings, <laughs> you know, it's like they start figuring out the donut a little bit more um, and looking at it from different approaches or should I look up on top of the donut or should I look from the side or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, whatever your subject is, I think at least you got to do at least three and then you're allowed to move on. <laughs> yeah permission. But yeah I probably yeah I but then again yeah I I like that approach because I like kind of having little pieces of paintings be part be like a thing and then done where it's like okay I did 12 of these paintings now I'm going to do something else or investigate something else so other people I mean you could just paint clouds your entire life and probably be okay Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, if it holds your interest like mm. yeah I was just watching a Edward Hopper documentary oh cool it's, yeah it's it's amazing you know like building and yeah no he's great I love that sort of stuff big like big shapes and like big abstract shapes of color and these sorts of things um he's great yeah I did a podcast on him actually Right. As well. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I should watch that. Yeah, because it's yeah, it's amazing and his relationship with his wife and you know different things. For and, sure. Yeah, about personality. I mean, you can you you can learn so much just by like learning about different artists' lives, like you know mm -hmm. the way they are and why they do certain things, their personality and their influences and background and stuff like that so it's very right and sometimes yeah it's really surprising when you find um a lot of like Jan van Eyck I was just like researching he did this painting the last judgment and then like the crucifixions next to it it's like a diptych but like yeah I would suggest anybody look at hell in Jan van Eyck's painting it's like there's like these beast dogs, just completely surreal and strange. And then um, when I was researching it, he put like, it was commissioned by the church and he put like members of the church in hell. Like he painted them there. So I don't know how he got away with that. Um, wow. But that. yeah, I just never like, I'd seen that painting because there's like this kind of bat like skeleton thing in it. Um but yeah, when I dug into it, it was just like, this is, and, it, and it's little, it's like, yeah, it's like 40 centimeters tall or something. And it's like um, the entire crucifixion and, wow. and the last judgment. And it's like this little painting with all this stuff in it. Um, but yeah, in terms of, yeah, looking at art history and stuff like this, I think it's just like, the more you look, the more you start discovering within it, you know, and it's just endless. Um it's kind of amazing you know it's like with with music you know there's only 12 notes it's not a lot of notes but you can do a lot with those 12 notes you know i mean there's a lot 
and it's the same with painting it's just like a few simple combinations or ideas and it's just endless so but yeah finding your work it doesn't your work doesn't have to fit into the crucifixion but it could you know yeah like there's yeah. no reason why it couldn't like it could fit into any direction you want to go which is pretty amazing mm -hmm. really maybe it's because the the night's painting is so small so the the church members can't mm -hmm. see them <laughs> in there yeah because they're just little hats they have like little hats and stuff <laughs> right, right. In the, down there mm -hmm. so i was like what yeah i don't know how they got away with stuff that's i'd love that art history book <laughs> yeah right oh that's that's great and uh what was i yeah so you were saying like you know just small you know amount of um uh, you can so like about uh what about what do you think about like a limited palette mm -hmm. you know the restrictions I, I only yeah i'm a really big stickler i only use um i just got into like um what is it called quinacridone and i started using that in alizarin crimson and stuff like that but generally i was just cad yellow cad red ivory black phthalo blue and um what am i forgetting that's it ultramarine uh yeah phthalo blue cad red cad yellow titanium white yeah mm -hmm. and um so always like i love limiting stuff I've played around with other limited palettes and it's super fun. Um, I'm sure most people know the the series on YouTube, YouTube Are Painted Lives. If you mm, know that by, yeah. by yeah, Nicholas Nicola Uribe. Uribe, yeah, I love yeah, I love that. And those those are so cool because he'll like just say his colors that he's using and then you get to see like how they work out. Um and he's got some really oddball combinations that just work out amazingly yeah um so yeah i love doing that just as an exercise i stole it blatantly from that so like finally i started buying paints um buying different colors right yeah and, i know yeah. His, his his usually his very muted palette that you know the the odd times he's done some yeah crazy crazy colors that you know they they right. all work right like it's just if you know how to Orgestra. draw is a big thing exactly drawing that's is what, so big that's what <laughs> i find out too like that is like like a hundred percent and that's why i still go to figure drawing every week you know i just like well i have them at my place so i just draw along with the class but it's like it is still like going to the gym in some ways and sometimes you're like how did i do this what is wrong with me yeah you know, know, you look at I... it and you're like, and then other times like, oh, this is, I know how to draw. This is great. I'm, I'm good at drawing. And then, yeah, next drawing, like what is wrong? <laughs> yeah. I wonder, you know, it, and, and it gets rusty so, so fast. Like mm. if I don't draw for a little bit, it's like, yeah. what's going on? You know, it's like, <laughs> you can draw, but what is this? I mean, this is awful. Definitely. Yeah. 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 A, I, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. No, no, no. I just say you got to keep it up. Like you say, it's a gym, you know, it's like lifting weights. Like if you don't, like the muscle just. Yeah. For sure. piece. Mm -hmm. We had a full life at Lyme Academy. We had a full life class, um, which I still remember. And it was like a six foot drawing, you know, that was the same size as the model. And it was a whole semester for one pose. Oh, which wow. seems kind of crazy but it's really not um it's it was less crazy than it seems you know yeah. mm -hmm. well because it's once a week you know and it's so it's like 12 sessions or whatever so it's oh, not okay. and it's big so you got a lot to render you know so it's it wasn't really that insane um but yeah that was fun because you'd really get into like okay this is the elbow going this way because like if it's smaller you can kind of be like just kind of like okay <laughs> yeah it's you can't see it <laughs> right be like all right that that works good enough all right that's an elbow now but mm -hmm. yeah when it's life size all of a sudden it's like okay i gotta figure this out um, wow yeah that's something i need to do like you know it's like long drawings like super long drawings I never... yeah 
or just set up like multiple or like approach it where you know it's not just something you're going to finish immediately or like you feel rushed or something you know just be like okay this is going to take some time three months or whatever mm -hmm. um yeah i can't remember nancy sparrow is that her name or something i can't remember her name but there's one woman who does this she does these graphite drawings that are the entire you know like the entire interiors of these galleries and, yeah uh, i think i saw that on instagram it's mind-boggling how much drawing that is but yeah yeah she, it's amazing it takes certain personality or discipline i mean like do you ever get bored you know what i mean like right doing a painting like it took so long or like or lose interest like no did it ever happen to you not really people have asked before because i do the painting every day thing but like yeah it's um i mean yeah it's like getting breakfast or whatever yeah, i think it's just part of like my normal routine and how i work and all these sorts of things and i get to listen to stuff so it's kind of nice you know mm, and what do you listen to like a lot of podcasts books on tape or whatever they call them now audiobooks these sorts of things um mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff i'm big into stephen king i like stephen king a lot okay okay yeah i can see that so all that stuff um mm -hmm. i can always get into because he's kind of like um yeah i like stephen king for a lot of reasons because his approach to work was um I, I'll get it wrong, but it's something like, I think he just works from like 10 o'clock till two o'clock every day. Cause they're always like, people would ask him, they're like, how do you write so many books? And he's like, uh, I mean, I work for like four hours a day. Then I get lunch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you write like eight pages a day, all of a sudden in a month you have 240 pages, you know? And it's like, I just do it every day for like three, four hours. And that's, that's it. Doesn't overwork himself, but oh. kind of still like chugs along and does this. Um, he also doesn't plot anything as well famously before he just starts writing. So, mm -hmm. um, I like, I like that approach, I guess. And that's kind of how I paint in some ways too. And just like, all right, let's go here. We're doing the thing. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm not like nervous or bored or annoyed. It's more like, let's do the thing and figure this out. Yeah. yeah. I love it. <laughs> so what's your routine? Like it would it be like not 10 to 12. Yeah, two or whatever. Um, it is almost that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is almost that. It's probably like nine to three o'clock or so, and I get lunch and stuff, and then um, because I teach in the evenings. Uh, so I have like the mornings free, and my daughter is in school as well. So that's when it started because I'd pick her up from school, um, around like three o'clock every day. So mm. that's kind of when it got locked in, and then now I'm teaching at night. So. Uh, it still works out good with that, yeah. But yeah, pretty much that's my my main routine: wake up, get to the studio, paint, figure out what I'm teaching, um, prepare the room, and this sort of stuff for the evening. But, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's great that you're kind of forced to to have a balance, right? You know. Right. Paint yeah. and then family and then teaching. Right. So it's it's more balanced rather than you can stay in your studio 24 hours you know? right yeah I'm not an I was never a nighttime painter I don't know why it's kind of odd um <laughs> you find but, it odd well people think it's weird people think I'd be the type of person to be painting at two in the morning <laughs> or on my sewing machine or something but yeah it's it's really the opposite I get up pretty early and get to the studio pretty early and yeah work in the mornings and then yeah um figure out what else I'm doing <laughs> yeah good no, that's good yeah so do you do you kind of like what they say um you you plan the night ahead you know what you're gonna do um in the morning like do you kind of have that structure or yep I actually have yeah it's funny you ask that because I have a very very nerdy approach <laughs> and um yeah I just have a whiteboard and oh, okay. I literally have a whiteboard and a checklist and I check stuff off and erase it. Um, that's my whole thing. There was one, I think it was, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I think it was on Shark Tank. You know, this show Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think it was like Kevin Leary on Shark Tank or something like that. He was talking about he's like the best like the best thing I ever did was when I finished work, I wrote down what I needed to do on a, a post-it note. And then mm -hmm. I put it somewhere I'd see the next morning and I'd get it done. And um, I kind of do that with my phone, you know, where I'll like write. It's just a basic notepad and I'll write down, okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. Um, Cause I kind of have a couple different things I'm juggling um, with the podcast and then making videos and then teaching at my own school then teaching for a university you know um so i have to be kind of organized um as organized as i can be i guess uh, but yeah then i just literally wipe stuff off the board i i cross it out first because then you get to see it crossed out you're like yeah, yeah i did that very satisfaction right <laughs> <laughs> but then you got to erase it eventually and put something else there unfortunately <laughs> but yeah <laughs> got everything done done and then look in your phone and you're like, oh, okay, I got to do this now. All right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do that with, um, because I also want to be with my painting. I want it to, you know, when it's something you're, you're doing for so long um, and like seeing all my grandmother's work as well, I do want it to kind of, it needs to have some direction, you know? And if you give yourself just a little bit, you know, just a little bit of a pathway, I think you can, you can find that direction and, and make more and more interesting works as you build on them and kind of build out that world, you know, that you've created. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I think like limitations like that are kind of important where it's like, this is a story about a cowboy in the Badlands, you know, like that. Okay. Now I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you're not just like flailing around. It doesn't have to be a story, but yeah, like I said, it could just be painting flowers. Mm, or donut or the donut yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be a favorite subject <laughs> yeah and on the line of um productivity like um do you know bobby chu on schoolism and... yes right yeah schoolism i've heard you're right yeah 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 so is he's that talking... no go ahead oh I'll no look it, it up you... just to remind myself yeah um and uh, he, he has this uh, productivity little webinar and he talks about, you know, because people ask him, you know, how did you get all these things done? Like everything done, mm -hmm. right? It's just like crazy schedule. Right. And he put, he said he put everything on Google Sheet. And uh, so that you can access it anywhere, right? Yeah. On your phone, whatever. So he just right. put stuff in, you know. And he would just allow maybe maximum of four categories, you know, it's like whatever home teaching, right? you know, your painting. And um, he would put everything you need to do there. And every day he would allow, you know, himself, you know, say, do this for one hour, like do everything for one hour mm -hmm. and, then, you know, check it off. Right. And then he has to, of course, you can do it longer if you need to right you know it depends yeah. on a certain thing but it's like you at least you give the chance like you know everything you do it for a one hour so then you get everything done eventually instead of just right do you know this for like 20 hours five days you know and then just neglect everything else yeah and, uh, and he would check his list every day you know like say the night before or something like that so and of course he can nice take some items off right if if it's not going to be done or not important so then you know then he can forget about it you know because it is there so he said you know and you don't have to be thinking right about it, right so it's it's always on the the sheet and then you get it done like at least give it one hour yeah and it feels great to finish it and then and our minds are so goofy i think with procrastinating um one thing I heard was that people will often give themselves things to do so they feel better about procrastinating. So it's like, if you really got to like change the tire on the car, um, you'll like wash the dishes because mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. you'll feel better and like, Hey, I did the dishes, you know, um, the car's still sitting there, but the dishes are clean now. Um, yeah. or it's kind of how we trick ourselves into like, you know, not doing that one thing. But if you have it an hour and it's like, I'm going to spend an hour fixing the car tomorrow. Um, that yeah. makes sense. You're probably going to have to barrel through and get it done. 
yeah just yeah, for sure you know, that's that makes sense you know but i wonder why why the procrastinating thing because you know like you said right you are doing something you you do the dishes so why don't you right work on the car you know it's just a funny the psychology i don't you know right understand that maybe we we fear like because it's important it's something that needs to be done you know so it's like i don't know i don't want to mess it up let me just do something else <laughs> Yeah, or maybe we should be like sitting under a tree collecting berries like a lion or something. <laughs> like yeah. lions don't work much of the day, I don't think. You know, they probably they they don't do a lot. I think they only hunt probably a couple hours a day, maybe a couple times a week. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe naturally we're just supposed to be like lions. chilling out. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah, giving ourselves things to do. I'm good at that. I'm good at giving myself things to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that's, yeah, it's great chatting with you. Anything you'd like to add about like, say the mentorship or um, let people know? About um, I, th or I think the main thing, um, you know, uh, anybody, whatever you're interested in, whatever direction you want to go in. I, I'm totally open to working with all different genres and approaches and techniques and these sort of things. And um, yeah, I would just, I'm, I like working with people and connecting with people and uh, helping them achieve what they want to do. So yeah, if that so works good. out for you, come on in. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. So once again, the, um, uh, Jeremiah's uh, mentorship group is scheduled to launch uh, on Sunday, January 21st. Um, so we can look up the information on masteries.com. So come join us. Yeah, it'll be fun. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's so great. nice chatting with you. You Jared. too. Thanks a lot. All right. Have a great day. <laughs> you too. Yeah, take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.